Chapter 2 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1 by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Perception, or Things and Their Deceptiveness. Translator's Note. In this, as in the preceding section, apprehension is effected under conditions of sense. But whereas in the preceding type of consciousness the universality which knowledge implies and requires no sooner appeared than it melted away, here in perception we start from a certain stability in the manner of apprehension and a certain constancy in the content apprehended. The universality in this case satisfies more completely the demands of knowledge. The problem for further analysis is to find the form which is the universal, here assumes and to determine the way in which the unity of the object, the thing, holds together in its essential differences as an unqualified or non-sensuous unity. It is an universal, but as such not conditioned by any sense. It is a pure or unconditioned universal, a thought proper. Being undetermined by sense, it transcends sense apprehension, and so transcends perception proper and compels the mind to adopt another cognitive attitude in order to apprehend it. This new attitude is understanding. The following section, thus indirectly, is an analysis of the principle and criticism of the proposition of pure sensationalism. It shows that the doctrine esse est percipi must give way to the principle esse est intelligi. End translator's note. Immediate certainty does not make the truth its own, for its truth is something universal, whereas certainty wants to deal with the this. Perception, on the other hand, takes what exists for it to be a universal, universality being its principle in general, its moments immediately distinguished within are also universal. I is a universal, and the object is a universal. That principle has arisen and come into being for us who are tracing the course of experience and our process of apprehending what is perception therefore is no longer a contingent series of acts of apprehension as is the case with the apprehensiveness of sense certainty it is a logically necessitated process with the organization of the principle both the moments which as phenomena merely fell at our feet as bare facts have come into being the one the process of pointing out and indicating the other as the same process but as a simple fact the former the process of perceiving the latter the object perceived the object is in its essential nature the same as the process the latter is the unfolding and distinguishing of the elements involved the object is the same elements taken and held together for a single totality for us tracing the process or in itself this expression refers to the distinction already made in the introduction between the point of view of the phenomenology and that of the actual consciousness whose procedure is being analysed in the phenomenology. That is, for us, which we, i.e. the philosophical we, are aware of by way of anticipation, but which has not yet been evolved objectively and explicitly. It is intelligible, but not yet intellectually realised. That is, in itself and sich which is implicit, inherent, or potential, and hence not yet explicitly developed. The terms for us and in itself are thus strictly alternative. The former looks at the matter from the point of view of the philosophical subject, the latter from the point of view of the object discussed by the philosopher. The implicit nature of the object can only be for us who are thinking about the object, and what we have in mind can only be implicitly true of the object. The alternative disappears when the explicit nature of the object is what we explicitly take the object to be. The universal qua principle is the essence of perception, and as against this abstraction, both the moments distinguished and that which perceives and that which is perceived are what is non-essential. But in point of fact, because both are themselves the universal, or the essence, they are both essential but since they are related as opposites, one can only be in the relation, constituting perception, to be the essential moment, and the distinction of essential and non-essential has to be shared between them. The one characterised as the simple fact, the object, is the essence, quite indifferent as to whether it is perceived or not. Perceiving, on the other hand, being the process, is the insubstantial, the inconstant factor, which can be as well as, or not be, the non-essential moment. 
this object we now have to determine more precisely and to develop this determinate character from the result arrived at the more detailed development does not fall in place here since its principle the universal is in its simplicity a mediated principle the object must express this explicitly as its own inherent nature the object shows itself by so doing to be the thing with many properties the wealth of sense knowledge belongs to perception not to immediate certainty where all that wealth was merely something alongside and by the way for it is only perception that has negation distinction multiplicity in its very nature this then is established as not this or as superseded and yet not nothing simplicite but a determinate nothing a nothing with certain content viz the this the sense element is in this way itself still present but not in the form of some particular that is meant as has to be the case in immediate certainty but as a universal as that which will have the character of a property cancelling superseding brings out and lays bare its true twofold meaning which we found contained in the negative to supersede aufheben is at once to negate and to preserve the nothing being a negation of the this preserves immediacy and is itself sensuous but a universal immediacy being however is a universal by its having a mediation or negation when it brings this explicitly out as a factor in its immediacy it is specifically distinct determinate property as a result there are many such properties set up at once one a negation and the other since they are expressed in the simple form of the universal these determinate characteristics which strictly speaking become properties only by further additional characteristics are self-related are indifferent to each other each is by itself free from the rest the simple self-identical universality however is itself again distinct and detached from these determinate characteristics it has it is pure self-relation the medium wherein all these characteristics exist in it as in a bare simple unity they interpenetrate without affecting one another for just by participating in this universality they are indifferent to each other each by itself this abstract universal medium which we can call thinghood is in general or in pure essential reality nothing else than is the here and now as this on analysis turned out to be viz a simple togetherness of many here's and now's but the many in the present case are in their determinateness themselves simply universals this salt is a simple here and at the same time manifold it is white and also pungent and also cubical in shape also of a specific weight and so on and all these many properties exist in a simple here where they interpenetrate each other none of these has a different here from the others each is everywhere but in the same time here and where the others are also and at the same time without being divided by different here's they do not affect each other in their interpenetration its being white does not affect or alter the cubical shape and has and neither affects its sharp outline and so on on the contrary since each is simple relation to itself it leaves the others alone and is related to these merely by being also along with them a relation of mere indifference this also is thus the pure universal itself the medium the thinghood keeping them together in this relation which has emerged it is merely the character of positive universality that is first noticed and developed but there is still a side presented to view which must also be taken into account it is this if the many determinate properties were utterly indifferent to each other and were entirely related to themselves alone they would not be determinate for they are so merely in so far as they are distinguished and related to others in their opposites in view of this opposition however they cannot exist together in this bare and simple unity of their medium in which unity is just as essential to them as negation the process of distinguishing them so far as it does not leave them indifferent but effectually excludes negates one from the other and thus falls outside this simple medium and this consequently is not merely and also a unity of indifference to what is in but is a one as well as an excluding repelling unity this one is the moment of negation as in a direct and simple manner relating itself to itself and excluding another 
and is that by which thinghood qua thing is determined in the case of the property negation becomes specified assumes a determinate character which is directly one with the immediacy of being and immediacy which by this unity with negation is universality qua the one however negation takes a form which it is freed from this unity with the object and exists per se on its own account these moments taken together exhaust the nature of the thing the truth of perception so far as it is necessary to develop it here it is one a universality passive and indifferent the also which forms the sole bond of connection between the qualities or rather constituent elements matters existing together two negation likewise in a simple form or the one which consists in excluding properties of an opposite character and three the many properties themselves the relation of the first two moments the negation as it is related to that indifferent element and in being so expands into a manifold differences the focal point of particularity radiating forth into plurality within the medium of substance taking the aspect that these differences belong to a medium indifferent to what is within it they are themselves universal they are related merely to themselves and do not affect each other taking however the other aspect that they belong to the negative unity that at the same time they mutually exclude one another but do so necessarily in the shape of properties that have separate existence apart from the also connecting them the sensuous universality the immediate unity of positive being and negative exclusion is only then a property when openness and pure universality are involved from it and distinguished from one another and when that sensuous universality combines these with one another only after this relation of the unity to those pure essential moments is effected is the thing complete this then is why the thing in perception is constituted and consciousness is perceptual in character so far this thing is its object it has merely to take the object capio perception and assume the attitude of pure apprehension and what comes its way in so doing is truth das vara if it did something when taking the given it would by such supplementation or elimination alter the truth since the object is the true and universal the self-same while consciousness is the variable and non-essential it may happen that consciousness apprehends the object wrongly and deceives itself the percipient is aware of the possibility of deception for in the universality forming the principle here the percipient is directly aware of otherness but aware of it as null and naught as what is superseded his criterion of truth is therefore self-sameness and his procedure is that of apprehending what comes before him as self-same since at the same time diversity is a fact for him his procedure is a way of relating the diverse moments of his apprehension to one another if however in this comparison a want of sameness comes out this is not an untruth on the part of the object for the object is the self-same but on the part of perception let us now see what sort of experience consciousness forms in the course of its actual perception we who are analyzing the process find this experience already contained in the development just given of the object and of the attitude of consciousness towards it the experience will merely be the development of the contradictions that appear there the object which i apprehended presents itself as purely one and single also i am aware of the property eigenschaft is in it a property which is universal thereby transcending the particularity of the object the first form of being in which the objective reality has the sense of a one was thus not its true being and since the object is the true fact here the untruth falls on my side and the apprehensiveness was not correct on account of the universality of the property eigenschaft i must rather take the objective entity as community Geimenschaft in general i further perceive now that the property to be determinate opposed to one another and excluding the other thus in point of fact i did not apprehend the object rightly when i defined it as commonness or community with others or as continuity and must rather taking account of this determinateness of the property 
divide the contingency and set down the object as one, a one that excludes. In the divided one I may find many such properties which are not attached to one another, but indifferent to one another. Thus I did not apprehend the object correctly when I took it for something that excludes. The object instead, just as formerly it was merely continuity in general, is now a universal common medium, where many properties in the form of sense universal subsist, each for itself and on its own account, and qua determinate, excluding the others. The simple and true fact which I perceive is, however, in virtue of this result, not a universal medium either, but the particular property by itself, which, again, in this form, is neither property nor determinate being, for it is now neither attached to a distinct one nor in relation to others. But the particular quality is a property only when attached to a one, and is determinate only by relation to others. By being this bare relation of itself to itself, it remains merely sensuous existence in general, since it no longer contains the character of negativity, and the mode of consciousness which is now aware of a being of sense is merely a way of meaning, meinen, or intending, i.e. it has left the attitude of perception entirely and gone back into itself. But sense existence and meaning themselves pass over into perception. I am thrown back on the beginning, and once more dragged into the same circuit that supersedes itself in every moment and as a whole. Consciousness, then, has to go over this cycle again, but it is not in the same way as on the first occasion, for it has found out, regarding perception, that the truth and outcome of perception is its dissolution, is reflection out of and away from the truth itself. In this way, consciousness becomes definitely aware of how its perceptual process is essentially constituted, viz., that this is not a simple bare apprehension, but in its apprehension is at the same time reflected out of the true content back into itself. This return of consciousness into itself, which is immediately involved and implicated in that pure apprehension, for this return to self has proved to be essential to perception, alters the true content. Consciousness is aware that this aspect is at the same time its own, and takes it upon itself, and by so doing, consciousness will thus get the true object bare and naked. In this way we have now, in the case of perception, as happened in the case of sense of certainty, the aspect of consciousness being forced back upon itself, but in the first instance, not in the sense in which this book took place in the former case, i.e. not as if the truth of perception fell within it. Rather, consciousness is aware that untruth that comes out here falls within it, by knowing this, however, consciousness is able to cancel and supersede this untruth. It distinguishes its apprehension of the truth from the untruth of its perception, corrects the untruth, and so far as itself takes in hand to make this correction the truth, qua truth of perception, certainty, falls within its own consciousness. The procedure of consciousness which we now have to consider is thus so constituted that it no longer merely perceives but is also conscious of its reflection into self, and keeps this apart from the simple apprehension proper. To begin with, then, I am aware of the thing as a one, and have to keep it fixed in this true character as one. If in the course of perceiving something crops up contraindicating that, then I must take it to be due to my reflection. Now, in perception, various different properties also turn up, which seem to be properties of the thing. But the thing is a one, and we are aware in ourselves that this diversity, by which the thing ceases to be a unity, falls in us. This thing then is, in point of fact, merely white to our eyes, also sharp to our tongue, and also cubical to our feeling, and so on. The entire diversity of these aspects comes not from the thing, but from us, and we find them falling apart thus from one another because the organs they affect are quite distinct inter se, the eye is entirely distinct from the tongue, and so on. We are consequently the universal medium where such elements get disassociated and exist each by themselves. By the fact, then, that we regard this characteristic of being a universal medium as our reflection, we preserve and maintain the self-sameness and truth of the thing, of its being a one. These diverse aspects which consciousness puts to its side of the account are therefore each by itself 
just as it appears in the universal medium specifically determined white is only in opposition to black and so on and the thing is a one just by the fact that it is opposed to other things it does not however exclude others from itself so far as it is one for to be one is in a universal relation to self to self and hence by the fact of its being one is rather like all it is through the determinate characteristic that this thing excludes other things things themselves are thus determinate in and for themselves they have properties by which they distinguish themselves from one another since the property is the special and peculiar property the proper property of the thing or of a specific characteristic of the thing itself the thing has several properties for in the first place the thing is true being it is a being inherently in itself and what is in it in so far as its own essential nature is not on account of other things hence in the second place the determinate properties are not on account of other things and for other things but inherent in that thing itself they are however determinate properties in it and only by the fact that they are several and maintain their distinction from one another and in the third place since they are thus within thinghood they are self-contained each in and for itself and are indifferent to one another it is then in truth the thing itself which is white and also cubical and also sharp and so on in other words the thing is the also the general medium wherein the many properties subsist externally to one another without touching or affecting one another and without cancelling one another out and so taken the also is accepted as the true being of the thing now on this mode of perception a rising consciousness is at the same time aware that it reflects itself also into itself and that in perceiving the opposite moment to the also crops up this moment however is the unity of the thing with itself a unity which excludes distinction from itself it is consequently this unity which consciousness has to take upon itself for the thing as such is the subsistence of many different and independent properties thus we say of the thing it is white and also cubical and also sharp and so on but so far as it is white it is not cubical and so far as it is cubical and white it is not also sharp and so on putting these properties into a one belongs solely to consciousness which therefore has to avoid letting them coincide and be one i e from the same property in the thing in the long run it introduces the idea of in so far to meet the difficulty and by this means it keeps the qualities apart and preserves the thing in the sense of the also quite properly consciousness at first makes itself responsible for the oneness in such a way that what was called a property is represented as being free matter materia libera in this way the thing is raised to the level of a true also since it thus becomes a collection of component elements materials or matters and instead of being a one becomes a mere enclosure a circumscribing surface if we look back on what consciousness formerly took upon itself and what it now takes upon itself what is previously ascribed to the thing and is now ascribed to it we see that consciousness alternately makes itself as well as the thing into both a pure atomic manyless one and an also resolved into independent constituent elements materials or matters consciousness thus finds through its comparison that not only its way of taking the truth contains the diverse moments of apprehension and return upon itself but that the truth itself the thing manifests itself in this twofold manner here we find as a result of experience that the thing exhibits itself in a determinate and specific manner to the consciousness apprehending it but at the same time is reflected back into the thing out of that manner of presenting itself into consciousness in other words the thing contains within it the opposite aspects of truth a truth whose elements are in antithesis to one another consciousness then gets away also from this second form of perceptual procedure that namely which takes the thing as its true self same and itself as a reverse as the factor which leaves sameness behind and goes back to itself its object is now the entire process which was previously shared between the object and consciousness the thing is a one reflected into itself it is for itself 
but it is also for another, and further it is another for itself as it is for another. The thing is, hence, for itself and also for another, a being that has difference of a twofold kind, but it is also one. It is being one, however, contradicts the diversity it has. Consciousness would, consequently, have again to make itself answerable for putting the diversity into the one, and would have to keep this apart from the thing. It would thus be compelled to say that the thing, in so far as it is for itself and not for another, but the oneness belongs to the thing itself too, as consciousness has found out. The thing is essentially reflected into itself. The also, the distinction of elements indifferent to one another, falls doubtless within the thing too, qua oneness, since both are different, they do not fall within the same thing, but in different things. The contradiction which is found in the case of the objective content as a whole is assigned to and shared by two objects. The thing is thus doubtless as it stands, and un für sich, self-same, but this unity with itself is disturbed by two other things. In this way the unity of the thing is preserved, and at the same time the otherness is that which is external to the thing and also outside consciousness. Now, although the contradiction in the object is in this way allotted to different things, yet the isolated individual thing will still be affected with this distinction. The different things have a subsistence on their own account, for sich, and the conflict between them takes place on both sides in such a way that each is not different from itself, but only from the other. Each is thereby characterized as something distinctive and contains in it essential distinctions from the others, but at the same time not in such a way that this is an opposition within its being. On the contrary, it is by itself a simple determinate characteristic which constitutes its essential character, distinguishing it from others. As a matter of fact, since the diversity lies in it, this diversity does indeed necessarily assume the form of a real distinction of manifold qualities within it. But because this determinate characteristic gives the essence of the thing by which it is distinguished from others, and has a being all its own, this further manifold constitution is something indifferent. The thing thus no doubt contains in its unity the qualifying in so far in two ways, which have, however, unequal significance, and by which the qualification of oppositeness becomes not a real opposition on the part of the thing itself, but so far as the thing comes into a condition of opposition through its absolute distinction, this opposition belongs to the thing with reference to another object lying outside it. The further manifoldness is doubtless necessary on the thing too, and cannot be left out, but it is unessential to the thing. This determinate characteristic, which constitutes the essential character of the thing and distinguishes it from all others, is now so defined that thereby the thing stands in opposition to others, but must therein preserve itself for itself, for sich. It is, however, a thing, a self-existent one, only in as far as it does not stand in relation to others. For this relation, the connection with others, is rather the point emphasised, and connection with another means giving up self-existence, meaning ceasing to have a being on its own account. It is precisely through the absolute character and its opposition that the thing relates itself to others, and is essentially the process of relation, and only this. The relation, however, is the negation of independence, and the thing collapses through its own essential property. The necessity of the experience which consciousness has to go through in finding the thing is destroyed just by the very characteristic which constitutes its essential nature, and its distinctive existence on its own account, may, as regards the bare principle it implies, be shortly stated thus. The thing is set up as having being on its own, and existing for itself, or as an absolute negation of all otherness. Hence it is absolute negation merely relating itself to itself. But this kind of negation is the cancelling and superseding of itself, or means that it has the essential reality in another. In point of fact, determination of the object as it the object has turned out, contains nothing else. It aims at having essential property constituting its bare existence for itself. But with this bare self-existence, it means also to embrace and contain diversity, which is to be a necessary, but is at the same time not to constitute its essential characteristic.
but this is a distinction that only exists in words the non-essential which has all the same to be necessary cancels out its own meaning or is what we have just called the negation of itself with this last qualifying in so far which separated self-existence and existence for another drops away altogether the object is really in one and the same respect the opposite of all for itself so far as is for another and for another so far as it is for itself it is for itself reflected into self one but all this is asserted along with its opposite with its being for another and for that reason is asserted merely to be superseded in other words this existence for itself is as much unessential as that which alone was meant to be unessential viz the relation to the other by this process the object in its pure characteristics in those features which were to constitute its essential nature is superseded just as the object in its sensible mode of existence becomes transcended from being sensible it passed into being a universal but this universal becomes derived from sense is essentially conditioned by it and hence is in general not a genuine self-identical universality but one affected with an opposition for this reason this universality breaks up into the extremes of singleness and universality of the one of the properties and the also of the free constituents of all matters these pure determinations appear to express the essential nature itself but they are merely self-existence which is fettered at the same time with the existence of another since however both essentially exist in a single unity we have therefore before us now an unconditioned absolute universality and it is here that the consciousness first truly appears into the sphere of understanding of intelligence sensible singleness thus disappears in the dialectic process of immediate certainty and becomes universality but merely sensuous universality the stage of meaning has vanished and perceiving takes the object as it inherently is in itself or put generally as a universal singleness therefore makes its appearance there as true singleness as the inherent nature of the one or as reflectedness into self this is still however a conditioned self-existence alongside which appears another self-existence the universality opposed to singleness and conditioned by it but these two contradictory extremes are not merely alongside one another but within one unity or what is the same thing the common element of both self-existence is entirely fettered to its opposite i e is at the same time not an existence for itself the sophistry of perception seeks to save these moments from their contradictions tries to keep them fixed by distinguishing between aspects by using terms like also and so far as and seeks in like manner to lay hold the truth by distinguishing the unessential element from an essential nature opposed thereto but these expedients instead of keeping away deception from the process of apprehension prove rather to be of no avail at all and the real truth which should be got at through the logic of the perceptual process proves to be in one and the same aspect the opposite of what his expedients imply and consequently to have as its essential content undifferentiated and undeterminate universality these empty abstractions of singleness and its antithetic universality and also of essence that is attended with a non-essential element an element which is all the same necessary are powers of interplay which constitute perceptual understanding often called sound common sense mention verstand this healthy common sense which takes itself for the solid substantial type of conscious life is in the sphere of perception merely the interplay of these three abstractions it is always poorest when it pretends to be richest in that it is tossed about by these unreal entities banded from one to the other and by its sophistry endeavours to affirm and hold fast alternatively now one then the exact opposite it sets itself against the truth and imagines philosophy has merely to do with things of the intellect merely manipulates ideas as a matter of fact philosophy does have to do with them too and knows them to be pure essential entities the absolute powers and ultimate elements but in doing so philosophy knows them at the same time in their determinate and specific constitution and is therefore master over them while this perceptual understanding takes them for the real truth it is led by them from one mistake to another 
it does not get the length of being aware that there is such simple essentialities operating within it and dominating its activity. It thinks it always has to do with quite solid material and content, just as sense certainty is unaware that its essence is the empty abstraction of pure being, but in point of fact it is these essential elements in virtue of which perceptual understanding makes its way hither and thither through every kind of material and content. They are its principal coherence and control over its varied material. They alone are what constitutes for consciousness the essence of sensuous things, what determines their relation to consciousness, and they are in their medium of the process of perceiving, with the truth it contains, runs its course. The course of this process, a perpetual alternative determining of the truth and superseding of this determination, constitutes, properly speaking, the constant everyday life and activity of perceptual intelligence of the consciousness that thinks it lives and moves in the truth. In this process it advances without halt or stay till the final result is reached, when these essential elements or determinations are all alike superseded, but in each particular moment it is merely conscious of one given characteristic as the truth and then again of its opposite. It no doubt suspects their unessentiality and to save them from impeding danger takes the sophistry of now asserting to be true what it had just affirmed not to be true. What the nature of these untrue entities wants, really, is to force this understanding to do, viz, to bring together and thereby cancel and transcend the ideas about that universality and singleness, about also and one, about that essentiality which is necessarily connected with an unessentiality and an unessential that is yet necessary. Understanding strives to resist by leaning for support on the qualifying terms in so far a different of aspect or by making itself answerable for one idea in order to keep the other separate and preserve it as the true one. But the very nature of these abstractions brings them together as they stand and of their own accord. Sound common sense robs these abstractions from their real nature. They compel understanding to go round in their whirring circle. When understanding tries to give them truth by one at a time taking their untruth upon itself, and another by calling deception mere appearance due to the uncertainty and unreliability of things, and again by separating the essential from what is necessary, and yet to be unessential, holding the former to be their truth as against the latter. When understanding takes this line, it does not secure them their truth, but convicts itself of untruth. End of chapter 2, recording by Morrison Aldi Bedfordshire. Part 1 of chapter number 3 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1 by George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number 3 The Force and Understanding, The World of Appearance and the Supersensible World, Part 1. Translator's Note The term force holds primarily with reference to the realm of nature whether physical or vital, but it is also used more or less analogically in reference to other spheres, e.g. morality. It is the objective counterpart of the activity of understanding. It is objectively the same kind of relation of unity to difference which is subjectively realised when the mind understands. Force is a self-conditioned principle of unity. The differences are the expressions of force, the unity involved in the differences out of itself. Understanding similarity is a self-conditioned process. It understands in reducing differences to some ultimate unity, which is capable of deriving or explaining those differences from itself. The unconditioned universal, to which we are led to by the analysis of perception, takes shape, therefore as a force. The question is, how are the elements of this unconditioned universal related, and how do they hold together? The answer is found in the highest achievement of the operation of understanding, the establishment of a kingdom of laws, which in its entirety is the meaning of the world in so far as understanding goes. But laws per se are looked on as an inner realm, which merely appears in the detailed particulars which these laws control, and in which those laws are made manifest. The differences, in fact, are phenomena, 
the laws per se the laws per se are behind the scenes the world as a whole thus becomes distinguished into a realm of phenomena and a realm of noumena these two realms set a new problem to the mind and must again be brought together in a completer way than understanding can do this new state of consciousness is self-consciousness in this section we have at once an analysis of empiricism and a criticism of the kantian solution of the problem of empiricism it is shown that if phenomena are appearances of noumena then the noumena do appear and are in fact nothing except so far as they appear otherwise the noumena so far from being hidden are worse than appearances they are illusion the phenomena are not merely appearances to the mind but appearances of something that does make itself manifest if phenomena are thus not external to and still less independent of noumena noumena are just as truly immanent in phenomena treated in any other way noumena can at best only be another kind of phenomena and this raises anew precisely the problem which the opposition of phenomena or noumena was intended to solve phenomena are related to noumena as the tree is to the wood not as compound is to its atoms the solution of the difficulty is thus only to be found in the type of consciousness which contains both and this hegel says is self-consciousness end of translator's note consciousness has found seeing and hearing etc pass away into the dialectic process of sense experience and has at the stage of perception arrived at thoughts which however it brings together in the first instance in the unconditional universal this unconditioned element again if it were taken as an inert essence bare and simple would itself be nothing else than the one-sided extreme of self in existence for the non-essential would then stand over and against it but if thus related to the latter it would be itself unessential and consciousness would not have got disentangled from the deceptions of perception whereas this universal has proved to be one which has passed out of such conditioned separate existence and returned into itself the unconditioned universal which henceforward is the true object of consciousness is still object of consciousness consciousness has not yet grasped its principle or notion qua notion there is an essential distinction between the two which must be drawn on the one hand consciousness is aware that the object has passed from its relation to another back onto itself and thereby become inherently and implicitly an sich notion but on the other hand consciousness is not yet the notion explicitly or for itself and consequently it does not know itself in that reflected object we who are analyzing experience found this object arise through the process of consciousness in such a way that consciousness is implicated and involved in the development of the object and the reflection is the same on both sides i e there is only one reflection but because in this movement consciousness had as its content merely the objective entity and not consciousness as such the result has to be given an objective significance for consciousness consciousness however still withdrawing from what has arisen so that the latter in objective form is the essential reality to consciousness understanding has indeed eo ipso done away with its own untruth and the untruth in its object what has thereby come into view is the notion of the truth as implicit inherent truth which is not yet notion or lacks a consciously explicit existence for itself and is something which understanding allows to have its way without knowing itself in it it works out its own reality for itself so that consciousness has no share in its process of free realization but merely looks on and apprehends that realization as a naked fact it is consequently our business in the first instance to step into its place and be the notion which works up into shape what is contained in the result with this complete formation of the object which is presented to consciousness as a bare extant fact mere consciousness awareness becomes for the first time conceptual consciousness conscious comprehension the result arrived at was an unconditional universal in the first instance in the negative and abstract sense that consciousness negated its one-sided notions and abstracted them it surrendered them this result however has inherently a positive significance it has established the unity of existence for self and existence for another 
in other words absolute opposites are immediately posited as one and the same reality first this seems to affect merely the formal relation of the moments to one another but to be for self and to be for another constitutes the content itself as well because the opposition looked at truly can have no other nature than what it has come about in the result viz that the content taken in perception for truth belongs in point of fact solely to the form and is dissipated into its unity the content is at the same time universal there can be no other content by which its peculiar constitution would refuse to return into this unconditioned universality such content would be some specific way or other of being for itself and taking up a relation to something else to be in general for self and to stand in relation to something else constitutes the very nature and meaning of that whose truth lies in being unconditionally universal and the result is through and through universal since however this unconditioned universal is an object for consciousness the distinction of form and content make it appear within it and in the shape of content the moments have the aspect in which they were first presented that of being on one side a universal medium of many substantial elements and on the other a unit reflected into self where their substantial independence is overthrown and done away with the former dissolves in the independence of the thing is the condition of passivity which consists in it being something for something else the latter is its individual substance its being something on its own account for sich we have to see what shape these moments take in the unconditioned universal which is their essential nature it is obvious at the outset that by existing only in this universal they do not in general lie any longer apart from one another but rather are in themselves essentially self-cancelling aspects and what is established is only their transition into one another one moment then appears as a universal medium or as the subsistence of independent constituents as the reality that stepped aside the independence of these constituent elements however is nothing else than this medium i e this universal is simply and entirely the plurality of such diverse universals that the universal is per se undivided unity with this plurality means however that these elements are each where the other is they mutually permeate one another without touching one another because conversely the manifold diversity is equally independent along with that too goes the fact that they are absolutely pervious and porous and are cancelled and superseded to be thus superseded again or the reduction of this diversity to bare and simple self-existence is nothing else than the medium itself and this is the independence of the different elements in other words the elements set up as independent pass directly over into their unity and their unity directly into its explicit diversity and the latter back once again into the reduction into unity this process is what is called force one of its moments where force takes the form of a dispersion of the independent elements each with a being of its own is the expression of force when however force takes the form of that wherein they disappear and vanish it is force proper force withdrawn from expressing itself and driven back into itself but in the first place force driven back into itself must express itself and secondly in that expression it is still force existing within itself as much as in thus being within itself is its expression when we thus keep both moments in this immediate unity it is understanding to which the conception of force belongs that is properly speaking the principle which carries the different moments qua different for per se they should not be different the distinction consequently exists only in thought stated otherwise only the mere conception of force has been put forward in the above not its realization in point of fact however force is the unconditioned universal which is in itself just what it is for something else or which holds in its difference within itself for it is nothing else than existence for another hence for force to be what it truly is it has to be completely set free from thought and has to be put forward as a substantial reality of these differences that is first the substance qua the entire force remaining essentially self-contained an und für sich and then its difference as substantial entities or as moments subsisting each in its own account force as such force as driven back within itself is in this way by itself an excluding unit for which the unfolding of the elements or differences is another thing subsisting separately and thus there are set up two sides distinct and independent but force is also the whole or it remains what in its very conception it is 
that is to say these differences remain mere forms superficial vanishing moments the differences between force proper withdrawn into itself and force unfolded and expressed in independent constituent elements would at the same time have no being at all if they had no subsistence i e force would have no being if it did not really exist in those opposite ways but to exist in this way as opposite aspects means nothing else than that both moments are themselves at the same time independent it is this process we now have to deal with the process by which both moments get themselves fixed as independent and then cancel their independence again looked at broadly it is manifest that this process is nothing else than the process of perceiving where the aspects both percipient and content perceived are at once inseparably united as regards the process of grasping the truth and yet by that very fact each aspect is at the same time reflected into itself is something on its own account in the present case these two aspects are elements or moments of force they subsist with one unity just as much as this unity which appears as the middle term for the distinct and independent extremes always gets broken into the very extremes which only becomes such through this taking place thus the process which formerly took the shape of the self-negation of contrary conceptions here assumes objective form and is a movement of force the result of which is to bring out the unconditioned universal as something which is not objective which is the inner unperceived being of things force is thus determined since it is taken as force or as reflected into itself is the one side of its notion and meaning but a substantial extreme and moreover the extreme established with the characteristics of oneness in virtue of this the subsistence of the elements which have arisen falls outside it and is something other than it since of necessity it has to be this subsistence i e to express externalize itself its expression takes the form that the other approaches it and incites it but in point of fact since it must necessarily express itself it has within itself this other which to begin with took up a position as something outside it the latter this other must be retracted in order that the force should be established as a single one and its essential nature which consists in its self-expression put forward as another approaching it externally force itself is rather this universal medium for the subsistence of the moments as constituted elements or in other words it has expressed or externalized itself and what was to be something outside it is attracting or inciting it is really force itself it exists now as the medium of the constituent elements which have been evolved but at the same time it is in its very nature one and single and has essentially the form of being that in which the various elements are superseded this oneness is in consequence now something other than external to force since force takes its place as the medium for the elements to exist in and force therefore has this essential being outside itself since however it must of necessity be the essential nature which as yet is not affirmed to be this other comes forward soliciting or inciting it to reflect into itself to turn this pseudo external factor into an aspect of itself in other words this other cancels its external expression in point of fact however it is force itself that is reflected into itself that is the sublation of the external expression the oneness vanishes as it appears viz as something external force is that very other is force thrust back onto itself what took the character of an external other and incited force at once into expression and to return into itself turns out directly to be itself force for the other shows itself to be universal medium as well as one end single and shows this in such a way as each of the forces assumes appeared at the same time to be merely a vanishing moment consequently force in that there is another for it and it is for another has a whole not yet developed its complete being there are two forces present at the same time the notion of both is no doubt the same notion but it has passed out of its unity into duality instead of the opposition continuing to be entirely and essentially a mere moment it appears to have escaped from the control of the unity and to have become owing to this diremption two quite independent forces we now have to see more precisely what sort of situation this independence introduces to begin with the second force stands towards the force incited in the character of inciting force and moreover with respect to its content plays the part of universal medium but since that second force consists essentially in an alternation of these two moments 
and is itself force, it is likewise, in point of fact, their universal medium only then when it is incited or solicited to being so. And in this same way too it is a negative unity or incites and leads to the retraction of force only by being incited thereto. As a result this distinction which took place between one force regarded as inciting and the other as incited turns also into one and the same reciprocal interchange of characteristics. The interplay of these two forces in this way arises from and consists in the two being thus determined with the opposite characteristics in their being for one another in virtue of this determination and in the complete and direct exchange of their characteristics a transition from one to the other whereby alone these determinations in which the forces seem to have appeared independently have being for example the inciting force set up as a universal medium and on the other hand the force incited as a force repressed but the former is universal medium just by the very fact of the latter being repressed that is to say this latter is really what incites the former and makes the medium it claims to be the former gets the character it has only through the other and is inciting force only in so far as it is incited by the latter to do so and loses just as readily this character given to it for this character passes or rather has already passed into the character of the other the former acting as an external way takes the part of the universal medium but only by its having been incited by the other forces to do so this means however that the latter gives it that position and is really itself essentially universal medium it gives the inciting agency this character just because this other character is essentially its own i e because it really is its own self to complete our insight into this principle of the process we may notice further that the distinctions themselves reveal distinctions in a twofold manner they are on the one hand distinctions of content since one extreme is force reflected into itself while the other is a medium for the constituent elements involved on the other hand they appear as distinctions of form since one incites and the other is incited the former being active and the latter passive as regards the distinction of content they are in a general way distinct or distinct for us who are analyzing the process as regards the form however they are independent in their relation they break away from one another of themselves and stand opposed in the perception of the movement of force consciousness becomes aware that the extremes in both of these aspects are nothing per se that rather these sides in which their distinction of nature was meant to consist are merely vanishing moments an immediate transition of each into its opposite for us however who are analyzing the process it was also true that as stated above per se the distinctions qua distinctions of content and form vanished and on the side of form the active inciting or independent factor was in its very nature the same as what from the other side of content was presented as a repressed force force driven back into itself the passive incited or related factor was from the side of form the same as what from the side of content took shape as universal medium for the many constituent elements from this we see that the notion of force becomes actual when it is resolved into two forces and when we see too how it comes to be so these two forces exist as independent entities but their existence lies in a movement towards each other of such a kind that in order to be each has to in reality get into its position purely through the other that is to say there being purely the significance of disappearance they are not like extremes that keep themselves something positively fixed and merely transmit an external property to one another through their common medium and by external contact they are what they are solely in this medium and in their contact with each other we have there immediately both force as it is independently force repressed within itself and also in its expression force inciting and force being incited these moments are thus not divided and set up as two extremes offering each other only as an opposite pole rather their true nature is simply and solely to be each other through the other and to be in the first instance no more than just what each is thus through the other since it is just that they have thus in point of fact no substances of their own which could support and maintain them the notion of force rather maintains itself as the essence in its very actuality force when actual exists wholly and only in its expression and this at the same time is nothing else than a process of cancelling itself 
this actual force when represented as detached from its expression and existing by itself is force driven back into itself but this feature is itself in point of fact as appears from the foregoing merely a moment in the expression of force the true nature of force thus remains merely the thought or idea of force the moments in its realization its substantial independence and its process rush without let or hindrance together into one single undivided unity a unity which is not force withdrawn into itself for this is merely one of those moments but is the notion qua notion the realization of force then is at the same time dissipation or loss of reality it thereby becomes something quite different viz this universality which understanding knows from the start or immediately to be its essential nature and which shows itself too to be the essence of it in what is supposed to be its reality in the actual substance so far as we look on the first universal notion of understanding where force does not yet exist for itself the second is now its essential reality as it is revealed in and for itself or conversely if we look on the first universal as the immediate which should be an actual object for consciousness then this second has the characteristic of being the negative of sensually objective force it is force in the form in which it is true being its force exists merely as an object for understanding the first would be force withdrawn into itself i e force as substance the second however is the inner being of things qua inner which is one and the same with the notion qua notion this true being of things here has the characteristic that it does not exist immediately for consciousness rather consciousness takes up mediated relation to the inner in the form of understanding it looks through the intervening play of forces into the real and true background of things the middle term combining the two extremes understanding and the inner of things is the explicitly evolved being of force which is now and henceforth a vanishing process for understanding itself hence it is called appearance for being which is per se straight away not being we call a show a semblance it is however merely not a show but the appearance a totality of seeming this totality as totality or universal is what makes up the inner world the play of forces in the sense of its reflections into itself there consciousness has before itself in objective form the things of perception as they truly are i e as moments turning without halt or separate subsistence directly into the opposite the one changing immediately into the universal the essential becoming at once something inessential and vice versa this play of forces is consequently the development of the negative but its true nature is the positive element viz the universal the implicit object the object existing per se the being of this object for consciousness is mediated through the movement of appearance by which the constituent of perception and the sensuous objective world as a whole get merely negative significance their consciousness is turned back upon itself as the truth but being consciousness it again makes the truth into an inner being of the object and distinguishes this reflection of things from its own reflection into self just as the mediating process likewise is for it still an objective process this inner nature is therefore for it an extreme placed over and against it but it is on that account the truth for it because therein as in something essential real it possesses at the same time the certainty of its own self the moment of its own self-existence but it is not yet conscious of this basis its self-existence for the independence its being on its own account which should have the inner world within it would nothing else than be the negative process this negative process is however for consciousness still objective vanishing appearance and not yet its own proper self-existence hence the inner is no doubt to be taken as notion but consciousness does not yet know the nature of the notion within this inner truth the absolute universal which has got rid of the opposition between universal and particular and become the object of understanding is a supersensible world in which henceforth opens up the true world lying beyond the sensuous world which is the world of appearance away remote from the vanishing present lies the permanent beyond an imminent inherent reality which is the first and therefore imperfect manifestation of reason i e it is merely the pure element where the truth finds its abode and its essential being end of chapter three part one recording by morris in alsey bedfordshire part two of chapter number three of the 
Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1 by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox is in the public domain. Part 2 of Chapter Number 3, The Force and Understanding, The World of Appearance and the Supersensible World. Our object henceforward has thus the form of a syllogistic inference, Schluss, whose extremes are the inner being of things and understanding, and its middle term the sphere of appearance. The course of this inferential process, however, furnishes the further characterization of what understanding detects in the inner world by the aid of the middle term, and gives rise to the experience understanding goes through regarding this relation of the combined and mutually inferable terms. The inner world is, as far as consciousness, a bare and simple beyond, because consciousness does not as yet find itself in it. It is empty, for it is merely the nothingness of appearance, and positively naked universal. This type of inwardness suits those who say that the inner being of things cannot be known, but the reason for the position would have to be taken in some other sense. Certainly there is no knowledge to be had of this inner world, as we have it here. Not, however, owing to reason being too short-sighted or limited, or whatever you call it, on this point there is as yet nothing known at this stage. We have not gone deep enough for that yet. But on account simply of the nature of the case, because in the void there is nothing known, or, putting it from the other point of view, because its very characteristic lies in being beyond consciousness. The result is, of course, the same if you place the blind man amid the wealth of supersensible world. If it has a wealth, whether this be content peculiarly its own, or whether consciousness itself be this content. And if you place one with sight in absolute darkness, or, if you like, in pure light, supposing the supersensible world to be this. The seeing man sees in that pure light as little as in absolute darkness, and just as much as the blind man in the ample fullness which lay before him. If there were really nothing further ado with the inner sphere, and with our being bound up along with it, by means of the world of appearance, then there would be nothing left but to stop at the phenomenal world, i.e. take something for truth about which we know it is not true. Or in order that there may be something in this empty void, which while it originally came about as a state devoid of objective things, has, however, since its emptiness pure and simple to be taken, also devoid of all mental relations and distinctions of consciousness qua consciousness, in order that the complete vacuity, which is even called the holy of holies, the inner sanctuary, there may yet be something we should be driven to fill it up with dreams, with appearances produced by consciousness itself. It would have to be content with being treated so badly, for it would not deserve anything better, since even dreams are something better than its own barren emptiness. The inner world, or the supersensible beyond, has, however, arisen. It comes to us out of the sphere of appearance, and the latter is its mediating agency. In other words, appearance is its essential nature, and in point of fact its filling. The supersensible is established truth of the sensible and perceptual. The truth of the sensible and the perceptual lies, however, in being appearance. The supersensible is, then, appearance qua appearance. We distort the proper meaning of this if we take it to mean that the supersensible is therefore the sensible world, or the world as it is for immediate sense certainty and perception. For, on the contrary, appearance is just not the world of sense knowledge and perception as positively being, but this world as superseded or established in truth as an inner world. It is often said that the supersensible is not appearance, but by appearance is thereby meant not appearance, but rather the sensible world taken as itself real actuality. Understanding, which is our object here, finds itself in this position, that, for it, the inner world has come about, to begin with, only as the implicit inherent being, universal and still without a filling. The play of forces has simply and solely this negative significance of not being something per se, and its only positive significance is that of being the mediating agency, but outside understanding. The relation of understanding to the inner world through mediation is, however, its own process by which the inner world will be found to receive fullness of content. The play of forces is what understanding has directly to do with it, but the real truth for it is the inner world, bare and simple. The movement of force is consequently the truth only by being in like manner something simple. Regarding this play of forces, however, we saw that its peculiarity lay in this, that the force which is awakened into activity by another force is just on that account the inciting agency for this other force, which thereby itself only becomes an inciting force. We have here in this way 
merely direct and immediate interchange or complete interchange of the characteristic which constitutes the sole content of what comes before us, viz. the fact of being either universal medium or negative unity. It ceases immediately on its entrance in determinate form to be what it was on entering. It awakens or incites by its appearance in determinate shape the other side, which thereby gives itself expression, i.e. the latter is now directly what the first was to be. Each of these two sides, the relation of inciting and the relation of the opposed determinate content, is on its own account an absolute process of permutation and transposition. But these two relations are again themselves one and the same, and the formal distinction being incited and inciting to activity is the same as the distinction of content, i.e. the distinction between the incited factor, as such, viz. the passive medium on the one side, and the inciting factor, viz. the active medium, the negative unity, or the one, on the other side. In this way there disappears all distinction and contrasted opposed particular forces, which were meant to be present in this process, for they rested solely on the above distinctions, and along with both those distinctions, the distinction between the forces collapses likewise into merely one. There is thus neither force nor inciting, and being incited to action, nor the characteristics of being a stable medium and a unity reflected into self, there is neither a particular which is something in its own account, nor are there diverse opposites. What is found in this flux of thoroughgoing change is merely difference as universal difference, or difference into which the various opposites have been resolved. This difference as universal, consequently, is what constitutes the ultimate simple element in that play of forces, and is the resultant truth of that process. It is the law of force. The absolute flux of the world of appearance passes into bare and simple difference through its relation to the simplicity of the inner being, the simplicity apprehended by understanding. The inner being is in the first instance merely the implicit universal. This implicit simple universal, however, is essentially absolute universal difference as well, for it is the outcome of the change itself, or change is in its very nature. But change, when planted in the inner reality, is as change truly is. Forthwith it is taken up into that reality as equally absolute universal difference at peace with itself, and remaining at one with itself. In other words, negation is an essential moment of the universal, and negation or mediation in the universal is universal difference. This difference is expressed in the law, which is the stable presentiment or picture of unstable appearance. The supersensible world is in this way a quiescent kingdom of laws, no doubt beyond the world of perception, for this exhibits the law only through incessant change, but likewise present in it and its direct immovable copy or image. The kingdom of laws is indeed the truth for understanding, and the truth finds its content in the distinction which lies in the law. At the same time, however, this kingdom of laws is only the preliminary truth, and does not give all the fullness of the world of appearance. The law is present therein, but is not all the appearance present. Under ever-varying circumstances the law has an ever-varying actual existence, thereby appearance continues to keep one aspect which is not in the inner world, i.e. appearance is not yet in the very truth established as appearance, as that whose independent being has been done away with. This defect of the law has to be brought out in the law itself. What seems defective in it is that while it no doubt has difference within it, it contains this in a merely universal, indeterminate way. So far, however, as it is not law in general, but a law, it has determinateness within it and as a result there are found an indeterminate plurality of laws. But this plurality is rather itself a defect. It contradicts the principle of understanding, for which, since it is consciousness of the simple inner being, truth is the inherently universal unity. It must, therefore, let the many laws coalesce into a single law, just as, e.g. the law by which a stone falls, and that by which the heavenly bodies move, have been conceived as one law. When the laws thus coincide, however, they lose their specific character. The laws become more and more abstract and superficial, and in consequence we find as a fact not the unity of these various determinate laws, but a law which leaves out their specific character, just as the one law which combines itself in the laws of falling terrestrial bodies and the movements of celestial bodies does not in point of fact express both kinds of laws.
the unification of all laws in universal attraction expresses no further content than just the bare concept of the law itself a concept which is therein set down as an existing universal attraction says merely that everything has a constant distinction for anything else understanding pretends by that to have found a universal law which gives expression to universal reality as such but in point of fact it has merely found the conception of law itself although in such a way that it is at the same time declaring reality to be in its very nature conforming to law the idea of universal attraction has therefore to this extent great importance that it is directed against the unthinking way of representing reality to which everything appears in the shape of accident and chance and for which determinateness specificity takes the form of sensuous independence in contrast then with determinate laws stand universal attraction or the bare conception of law in so far as the pure conception is looked on as the essentially real or as the true inner being the determinateness characterizing the specific law itself belongs still to the sphere of appearance or rather to sensible existence but the pure conception of law transcends not merely the law which being itself a determinate law stands contrasted with other determinate laws but also transcends law as such the determinateness of which we spoke is itself strictly a mere vanishing moment which can no longer come forward here as an essential entity for it is only the law which is the truth here but the conception of law turned against the law itself that is to say in the law distinction itself is immediately apprehended and taken up into the universal thereby however making the moments whose relation it expresses subsist as mutually indifferent and inherently real entities these parts of the distinction found in the law are however at the same time themselves determinate aspects the pure concept of law as universal attraction must to get its true significance be so apprehended that in it the absolutely single and simple the distinctions which are present in law as such return again themselves to into the inner being qua bare and simple unity this unity is the inner necessity of the law the law is thereby present in a twofold form in one case it is there as the law in which the differences are expressed as independent moments in the other it is in the form of a simple withdrawal into itself which again can be called force but in the sense not of repressed force spoken of above but force in general or the concept of force an abstraction which absorbs the distinctions involved in what attracts and is attracted in this sense e g simple electricity is force the expression of difference falls however within the law this difference is positive and negative electricity in the case of the motion of falling bodies force is the simple element gravity which has the law that the magnitudes of the different factors in motion the time spent the space traversed are to one another the relation of root and square electricity itself is not difference per se is not in essential nature a twofold entity consisting of positive and negative electricity hence it is often said it has the law of being so and so in the way indicated or again that it has the property of expressing itself in this fashion the property is doubtless the essential and peculiar property of the force i e it belongs to it necessarily but necessity here is an empty phrase force must just because it must duplicate itself in this matter of course if positive electricity is given negative electricity is inherently necessary for the positive element only is by relating to a negative in other words the positive element in its very self involves difference from itself just in the same way as the negative does but that electricity as such should break up itself into parts in this way is not itself a necessity electricity qua simple force is indifferent to its law to be in the form of positive and negative and if we call the former its notion and the latter its being then its notion is different to its being it merely has this as a property which just means that this is not per se necessary to it this indifference takes another form when it is said that to be positive and negative is involved in the definition of electricity or that this is neither more nor less than its notion and its essence its being in that case would mean its existence in general but that definition of the necessity of its existence is not contained it exists either because we find it i e its existence is not necessarily at all or else it exists through other forces i e the necessity of existence is an external necessity but in that the determinateness of being through another is what the necessity consists in 
we are back again to the plurality of determinate laws which we have just left in order to consider law as law it is only with the latter that we can compare its notion as notion or its necessity this necessity however has in all these forms shown itself just to be an empty phrase there is still another way in which that just indicated in which the indifference of law and force or of notion and being is found in the law of motion e g it is necessary for motion to be broken up into the elements of time and space or again into distance and velocity since motion is merely the relation of these factors motion the universal has in this way certain distinct parts to its own self but now these parts time and space or distance and velocity do not express themselves in this origination from a single unity they are indifferent the one to the other space is thought of as able to be without time time without space and distance at least without velocity just as their magnitudes are indifferent the one to the other since they are not related like positive and negative and consequently do not refer to one another by their very nature the necessity of partition into distinct factors then we certainly do have here but not the necessity of the parts as such for one another on that account however the first necessity it too is itself merely delusory false necessity for motion is not itself thought of as something simple or as bare essence but as from the first divided into elements time and space are in themselves its independent parts or its real elements in other words distance and velocity are modes of being or ways of thinking each of which can very well be without the other and motion is consequently no more than their superficial relation not their true nature if it is represented as simple essence or as force motion is no doubt gravity but this does not properly speaking contain these distinctions the distinction is then in both cases no distinction of an inherent or essential kind either the universal force is indifferent to the division into its parts which is found in the law or else the distinction the parts of the law are indifferent to one another understanding however does not have the notion of distinction per se just by the fact that law is in part its inner being the inherent nature but is in it at the same time distinguished that this distinction is in its way inner distinction is shown by the fact that law is bare and simple force or is the notion of that distinction and thus a distinction of the notion but still this inner distinction falls to begin with only within understanding and is not yet established in the fact itself it is thus only its own necessity to which understanding gives expression the distinction that is to say is one which makes only so as at the same time to express the distinction is not to be a distinction in the nature of the fact itself this necessity which is merely verbal is thus a rehearsal of the moments which make up the cycle of necessity they are no doubt distinct but their distinction is at the same time explicitly stated not to be a distinction of the fact itself and consequently is itself again straightway cancelled and transcended this process is called explanation a law is expressed from this its inherently universal element or the ground in the sense of force is distinguished but regarding this distinction it is asserted that it is no distinction rather that the ground has entirely the same constitutive nature as the law for example the particular occurrence of lightning as apprehended as universal and this universal is expressed in the law of electricity the explanation thereupon merges the law in force as the essence of the law this force is then so constituted that when it finds expression opposite electrical discharges appear and these again disappear into one another in other words force has exactly the same constitutive character as law both are thus declared to be in no way distinct the distinctions are pure universal expressions or law or pure force but both have the same content the same constitutive character thus the distinction between them qua distinction of content i e of fact is also again withdrawn in this tautological process of understanding as the above shows holds fast to the changeless unity of its object and the process takes effect solely within understanding itself and not in the object it is an explanation that not only explains nothing but is so plain that while it makes as if it would say something different from what is already said it really says nothing at all but merely repeats the same thing over again so far as the fact itself goes this process gives rise to nothing new the process is only of account as a process of understanding in it however we now get acquainted with just what we missed in the case of the law absolute change itself for this process when looked at more narrowly is directly the opposite of itself it sets up that is a distinction 
which is not only for us no distinction but which itself cancels as distinction this is the same process of change which was formerly manifested as the play of forces in the latter we found distinction of inciting and incited force or force expressing itself and force withdrawn into itself but these were distinctions in which reality were no distinctions and therefore were only immediately cancelled again we have here not merely the naked entity so that no distinction could be set up at all the process we have is rather this that a distinction is certainly made but because it is no distinction again it is superseded thus then with the process of explaining we see the ebb and flow of change which was formerly characteristic of the sphere of appearance and lay outside the inner world finding its way into the region of the supersensible self our consciousness however has passed from the inner being as an object over to understanding on the other side and finds the changing process there the change in this way is not yet a process of the fact itself but rather presents itself before us as pure change just by the content of the moments of change remaining the same since then the notion qua notion of understanding is the same as the inner nature of things this change becomes for understanding the law of the inner world understanding thus learns that it is a law in the sphere of appearance for distinctions to come about which there are no distinctions in other words it learns that what is self-same is self-repulsive and similarly that the distinctions are only such as in reality are none and cancel one another or that what is not self-same is self-attractive here we have a second law whose content is the opposite of what was formerly called law viz the invariable and unchanging self-identical distinction for this new law expresses rather the process of like becoming unlike and unlike becoming like this notion demands of the unreflective mind to bring both laws together and become conscious of their opposition of course the second is also law an inner self-identical being but it is rather a self-sameness of the unlike a constancy or inconstancy in this play of forces this law turned out to be just the absolute transition and pure change the self-same force split into an opposition that in the first instance appeared as a substantial independent distinction which however in point of fact proved itself to be none for it is the self-same which repels itself from itself and this element repelled in consequence was self-attracted for it is the same the distinction made since it is none thus cancels itself again this distinction is hence set forth as a distinction on the part of the fact itself or as an absolute objective distinction and this distinction on the part of the fact is nothing but the self-same that which has repelled itself from itself and consequently only set up an opposition which is none by means of this principle the first supersensible world the changeless kingdom of laws the immediate ectype and copy of the world of perception has turned around into its opposite the law was in general like its differences self-identical now however it is established that each side is on the contrary the opposite of itself the self-identical repels itself from itself and the self-discordant sets up to be self-same in truth with a characteristic of this kind distinction is only inner distinction or imminent distinction since the like is unlike itself and the unlike like itself this second supersensible world is in this way the inverted world verkade welt and moreover since one aspect is already present in the first supersensible world the inverted form of this first the inner being is thereby in its character of appearance completed for this first supersensible world was only the immediate raising of the world of perception to the element of universality it had its necessary counterpart in this world of perception which still retains as its own principle of change and alteration the first kingdom of laws dispenses with this principle but preserves it in the form of an inverted world by the law of this inverted world then the self-same in the first world is the unlike of itself and the unlike in the first world is equally unlike itself to itself or it becomes like itself expressed in determinate moments this will assume the form that what by the law of the first is sweet in this inner inverted reality sour what is there black is here white what by the law of the first was the north pole in the case of the magnet is in its other supersensible inner world viz in the earth south pole while what was there south pole is here north pole similarly what by the first law is in the case of electricity the oxygen pole becomes in its other supersensible reality the hydrogen pole and conversely what is there the pole of hydrogen becomes here the pole of oxygen 
To take another sphere of experience, revenge on an enemy is, according to the primitive and immediate law, the supreme satisfaction of injured individuality. This law, however, that of standing up against one who doesn't treat me as a substantial self, letting him see that I am a substantial being, and even doing away with him as a reality, this law is converted by the principle of the other world into its very opposite, viz., into the reinstatement of myself as the true reality through the removal of the alien hostile being in self-destruction. This primitive procedure of individual vengeance finds its inner meaning revealed in the ethically justifiable procedure of punishment, but ethical punishment is really self-punishment, for example Plato's Georgias. Punishment, however, has an inner meaning of its own too. If now this inversion which is brought out in the punishment of crime is made into a law, it also is again only the law of a world which is, has an inverted, supersensuous world standing in antithesis to itself, where that which is despised in the former comes to honour, and that which is in the former honoured meets with contempt. This punishment, by which the law of the former disgraces a man and annihilates him, turns around in its inverted world into the pardoning grace which preserves his being and brings him into honour. Looked at on the surface, this inverted world is the antithesis of the first, in the sense that it has the latter outside itself, and repels that world from itself as an inverted reality, that in the one is the sphere of appearance, while in the other is the inherited being, that the one is in the world as it is for another, the other again is in the world as it is for itself. In this way, to use the previous examples, what tastes sweet is properly or inwardly in the thing sour, or what is the North Pole is in the case of the actual magnet belonging to the sphere of appearance, would, in the inner or essential being, be South Pole. What is shown to be Oxygen Pole is that in electricity, as a phenomenon, would be Hydrogen Pole, in the case of electricity not falling within the sphere of appearance, or again, an act which in appearance is a crime, would in its inner nature be capable of being really good. A bad act may have a good intention. Punishment is only in appearance punishment. In itself or in another world it might well be for the criminal a benefit. But such oppositions of inner and outer appearance, and supersensible in the sense of two sorts of reality, are no longer to be found here. The differences repelled are not divided anew and assigned into two substances, such as would support them and lend them a separate subsistence, the result of which would be that understanding would leave the inner region and fall back again on its previous position. The one aspect or substance would be once more the world of perception, where the one of these two laws would carry on its existence, an opposition to it in an inner world, just as sensible world as the first, but in the sphere of ideas, one that could not be indicated, seen, heard, and tasted in a sensible world, and yet would be thought of as such a sensible world. But in point of fact, if the one element set up in its perceived reality and its inherent being, as its inverted form is at the time a sensuously represented element, then the sour, which would be the inherent nature of the sweet thing, is a real thing just as much as the latter would be a sour thing. Black, which would be the inherent nature of white, is the actual black. The North Pole, which is the true reality of the South Pole, is the North Pole present in the same magnet. The Oxygen Pole is the inherent nature of the pole of hydrogen, is the given Oxygen Pole of the same voltaic pile. The actual crime, however, finds its inversion and in its inherent nature qua possibility in the intention as such, but not a good intention. For the truth of intention is simply the deed itself. The crime, so far as its content goes, recoils upon itself and finds its inversion in actual punishment. This is the reconciliation of the law, with the reality set up against it in crime. Finally, the actual punishment carries its inverted reality with it in such a way that it is a kind of realization of the law, whereby the activity which the law exercises in the form of punishment is cancelled in the process a manner of realisation through which the law, from being actively operative, becomes again quiescent and authoritative, and the conflict of individuality with it, and of it with individuality, is extinguished. From this idea, then, of inversion, which constitutes the essential nature of one aspect of the supersensible world, we must dissociate the sensuous idea of keeping distinctions substantively fixed in a different element that sustains them and this absolute notion of distinction must be set forth and apprehended purely as inner distinction, self-repulsion of the self, self as self-same, and likeness of the unlike as unlike. We have to think pure flux, opposition within opposites itself, 
or contradiction for in the distinction which is an internal distinction the opposite is not only one of two factors if so it would not be an opposite but a bare existent it is the opposite of an opposite or the other is itself directly and immediately present within it no doubt i put the opposite here and the other of which it is the opposite there that is i place the opposite on one side taking it by itself without the other just on that account however since i have the opposite all by itself that it is the opposite of its own self that is it is in point of fact the other immediately within itself thus the supersensible world which is the inverted world has at the same time reached out beyond the other world and has itself in that other it is to itself conscious of being inverted for sich verkehrte i e it is the inverted form of itself it is that world itself and its opposite in a single unity only thus is its distinction an internal distinction or distinction per se in other words only thus is it in the form of infinity by means of infinity we see law attaining the form of inherent necessity and so realizing its complete nature and all moments of the sphere of appearance are thereby taken up into the inner realm that the simple and ultimate nature of law is necessity means according to the foregoing analysis a that it is a self-identical element which however is inherently distinction or that its self-sameness which repels itself from itself breaks asunder into two factors what was called simple force duplicates itself and through its infinity is law it means b that what is thus sundered constituting as it does the parts which are thought of as the law puts itself forward as substituting as stable and if the parts are considered without the conception of internal distinction then space and time or distance and velocity which appear as moments of gravity are just as much indifferent and without necessary relation to one another as to gravity itself or again as this bare gravity is indifferent to them or as simple electricity is indifferent to positive and negative but c by this conception of internal distinction this unlike and indifferent factor space and time etc becomes a distinction which has no distinction or merely a distinction of what is self-same and whose essences lie in unity they are reciprocally awakened into activity as positive and negative by each other and their being lies rather in the setting themselves as not being and cancelling themselves out in the common unity but the factors distinguished subsist they are per se and they are per se as opposites that is they are the opposites of themselves they have their antitheses within them and are merely one single unity this bare and simple infinity or the absolute notion may be called the ultimate nature of life the soul of the world the universal life-blood which courses everywhere and whose flow is neither disturbed nor checked by any obstructing distinction but itself is every distinction that arises as well as that to which all distinctions are dissolved pulsating within itself but with ever motionless shaken to its depths but still at rest it is self-identical for the distinctions are tautological they are distinctions that are none this self-identical reality stands therefore in relation solely to itself to itself which means that this is another to which the relation points and relation to itself is more strictly breaking asunder in other words that very self-identity is internal distinction these sundered factors have hence each in a separate being of their own each is an opposite of another and thus with each other is therein ipso facto expressly given or it is not the opposite of another but it is the pure opposite and thus each is therefore in itself the opposite of itself or again each is not an opposite at all but exists purely for itself a pure self-identical reality with no distinctions in it this being so we do not need to ask still less to treat anxiety over such questions as philosophy or even regard this as a question philosophy cannot answer how distinction or otherwise is to come out of this pure essence how these are to be really got out of it for this process of disruption has already taken place distinction has been excluded from the self-identical entity and put to one side so far as it is concerned what should have been taken as the self-identical is thus already one of the sundered elements instead of being the absolute essential reality that the self-identical breaks asunder means therefore just as truly that it supersedes itself as already sundered that it cancels itself qua otherness the unity which people usually have in mind when they say distinction cannot come out of unity 
is in point of fact itself merely one moment of the process of disruption it is the abstraction of simplicity which stands in contrast with distinction but in that it is abstraction is merely one of the two opposed elements the statement thus already implies that the unity in the process of breaking asunder is for the unity a negative element an opposite then it is put forward precisely as that which contains the opposition within it the different aspects of diremption and of becoming self-identical are therefore likewise merely this process of self-cancelling for since the self-identical element which should first divide itself asunder or pass into its opposite is an abstraction i e is already itself a sundered element its diremption is eo ipso a cancelling of what it is and thus the cancelling of what is being sundered the process of becoming self-identical is likewise a process of diremption what becomes identical with itself thereby opposes itself to disruption that is itself thereby puts itself on one side in other words it becomes really something sundered infinitude this absolute unrest of pure self-movement such that whatever is determined is in any way e g as being is really the opposite of this determinateness has from the start no doubt the very soul of all that has gone before but it is in this internal world that it has first come out explicitly and definitely the world of appearance or the play of forces already shows its operation but it is in this first instance as explanation that it comes openly forward and since it is at length an object for consciousness and consciousness is aware of it as what it is consciousness is in this way self-consciousness understanding's functions of explaining furnishes in the first instance merely the description of what self-consciousness is understanding cancelled the distinction present in law distinctions which have already become pure distinctions but are still indifferent and puts them aside in a single unity force to bring about this identification however is at the same time and immediately a process of diremption for understanding removes the distinctions and sets up the oneness of force only by the fact that it creates new distinctions of force and law which at the same time however is no distinction and in spite of the fact that this distinction is at the same time no distinction it goes on to deal with it and to cancel this distinction again since it lets force have just the same constitutive character as law this process or necessity is however in this form still a necessity and a process of understanding or well, the process as such is not the object of understanding instead understanding has as its object in that process positive and negative electricity distance velocity force or attraction and a thousand other things objects which make up the content of the moments of the process it is just for that reason that there is so much satisfaction in explanation because consciousness being there if we may use such an expression in direct communion with itself enjoys itself only no doubt it there seems to be occupied with something else but in point of fact it is busied all the while merely with itself in the opposite law as the inversion of the first law or in internal distinction infinitude doubtless becomes itself object of understanding but once more understanding fails to do justice to infinity as such since understanding assigns again into two worlds or to two substantial elements that which is distinction per se the self-repulsion of the self-same and the self-attraction of unlike factors to understanding the process as it is found in experience is here an event which happens and the self-same and the unlike are predicates whose reality is an underlying substratum what is for understanding an object in a covering veil of sense now comes before us in its essential form as pure notion this apprehension of distinction as it truly is apprehension of infinitude as such is something for us observing the course of the process or is implicit imminent the exposition of its notion belongs to science consciousness however in the way it immediately has this notion again appears as a peculiar form or new attitude of consciousness which does not recognize its own essential nature in what has gone before but looks upon it as something quite different in that this notion of infinitude is its object it is thus a consciousness of the distinction as one which is at the same time at once cancelled consciousness is for itself and on its own account a distinguishing of what is undistinguished it is self-consciousness i distinguish myself from myself 
and therein i am immediately aware that this factor distinguished from me is not distinguished i the self-same being thrust myself away from myself but this which is distinguished which is set up as unlike me is immediately on its being distinguished no distinction for me consciousness of another of an object in general is indeed itself necessarily self-consciousness reflected into itself consciousness of self in its otherness the necessary advance from the previous attitudes of consciousness which found their true content to be a thing something other than themselves brings into light this very fact that not merely is consciousness of a thing only possible for self-consciousness but that this self-consciousness alone is the truth of those attitudes but it is only for us who trace this process that this truth is actually present it is not yet so for the consciousness immersed in the experience self-consciousness has in the first instance to become a specific reality in its own account for sich has come into being for itself it is not yet in the form in which unity with consciousness in general we see that in the inner being of the sphere of appearance understanding gets to know the truth in nothing else but appearance itself not however appearance in the shape of a play of forces but that play of forces in its absolute universal moments and in the process of those moments in fact understanding merely experiences itself raised above perception consciousness reveals itself united and bound up with the supersensible world through the mediating agency of the realm of appearance through which it gazes into this background that lies behind appearance the two extremes the one of the pure inner region the other that of the inner being gazed into this pure inner region are now merged together and as they have disappeared qua extremes the middle term the mediating agency qua something other than these extremes has also vanished this curtain of appearance therefore hanging before the inner world is withdrawn and we have here the inner being the ego gazing into the inner realm the vision of the undistinguished self-same reality which repels itself from itself affirms itself as a divided and distinguished inner reality but as one for which at the same time the two factors have immediately no distinction what we have here is self-consciousness it is manifest that behind the so-called curtain which is to hide the inner world there is nothing to be seen unless we ourselves go behind there as much in order that we may thereby see as there may be something behind there which can be seen but it is clear at the same time that we cannot without more ado go straight away behind there for this knowledge of what is the truth of the idea of the realm of appearance and of inner being is itself only a result arrived at after a long and devious process in the course of which the modes of consciousness meaning perception understanding disappear and it would be equally evident that to get acquainted with what consciousness knows when it is knowing itself requires us to fetch a still wider compass what follows will set this forth at length end of chapter three recorded by morris in alsey bedfordshire